Hi, this is Dr. MJ coming to you from beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. This is the Women in Dentistry podcast where we feature women in dentistry making waves and leading the industry through the next decade. I am your host, Dr. Mary Jane Hanlon, a former dental assistant, dental hygienist, and now dentist. I am pleased to introduce you today to Eleni Kaliakos. Eleni is a presence and presentation expert and the chief transformational officer of the Eleni Group, now well into its second decade. She uses performance techniques learned over 20 years as a professional actress in New York and Los Angeles to help executives all over the globe be relaxed, real, and relatable when they give presentations. Her presentation skills coaching has brought dentists across the country to the next level. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to Eleni Kaliakos. Eleni, I am so excited to have you with us today, and I, I can't wait to introduce you to the audience and have you share a little bit about your story and how you got involved in the dental world. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to our channel, and also don't forget to hit the bell so you never miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much. Well, I am maybe more excited than you are, and I, I sincerely am. And, you know, I started working with dentists as a presentation coach several years ago. I Just once in a while, a dentist would come into my office and work with me, and I discovered that the dental world required public speaking periodically. I didn't know. It seemed that there was a need for dentists to be able to get up, train other people in their specialties, in their expertise, and as well as various um, dental conferences that required people to get up and give a good five or 10 minute speech that was often um, put in a, a competition format. There were all kinds of opportunities for speaking in the dental world. And over time, my pal, Mark LeBlanc, said to me, you know, I know you're working with some dentist, but you need to find, you need to move yourself toward the dental world a little bit more because I think there's so many people in there who might need your services. And here's what, honestly, when I went to my very first dental conference, I fell in love. That's the way I'm going to put it. I fell in love. Basically, a wonderful group of what I call everyday healers, people who are there to heal and help and make a difference. I love working with everyday healers and um, all eager to go out there and use their words to change their world. And that, that is really what not only attracted me, but has kept me involved ever since. Isn't that exciting? It's really, I have seen you in action. You have done an amazing job with so many great, talented speakers. And, you know, in and of themselves, I know they have talent, but I know that you make them better because you coach at such a high level. So tell me a little bit about what that experience was first like, you know, learning you know, we tend to be those anal retentive types and <laughs> we can be, we can be a little bit difficult to work with. I will just fully admit personally. Anyway, I just think that, that it could be tough on people from the outside, especially if you have a different personality. Most of us are that anal retentive perfectionist type and we fit right into dentistry because that's the way we, we think. But somebody from not, not inside the profession may have some difficulty. So did you have any difficulty transitioning in? That's a wonderful question. The good news is I live near the University of Michigan and had worked with a lot of anally retentive doctors. And also in this area, I work with a lot of anally retentive people in tech, a lot of engineers. So... I'm often working with people who get very excited about what's in the weeds. And my job is to help pull them back, bring it up to a level that the audience can understand, keep it clear, and above all, keep it human, accessible, relatable. And so it wasn't as foreign to me as you might think. 
and, 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 and frankly, one of the things that I found with dentists was a great degree of enthusiasm, at least the ones I've worked with. Now, enthusiasm, if you can, if you can get people to step away from the anal retentiveness and tell stories and connect from a human level and harness that enthusiasm, that is gold as far as I'm concerned. That's what I have found. Very good, because I just spent a fair amount of time in my study group talking to my students about stories and how important it is to, to have their, you know, I, I actually used Mark LeBlanc's book as a way to teach them about their personal statement, their personal paragraph, and then developing their personal story. And I worked one-on-one -on -one with a couple of students, not too many, because, you know, they don't understand how important that is yet. But I have worked with a couple of students to help refine that so that when they do a new patient exam and they are introducing themselves to the patient, they're very clear about what their statement and story is because I think it's critically important to help engage and build that trust and relationship. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I personally don't think there is anything as effective as a story well told and particularly a story that helps someone see how they can get from, I will say the word disaster, though it doesn't have to be disaster, from disaster in a sense to success, you know, where, where you see an arc of possibility, you know, people understand story. And, and I also work with a lot of entrepreneurs and they are most of them small business owners, right? Like so many dentists, you know, they have their own practices, so to speak. And I'm always saying you have, you are collecting stories every single day. You have stories that have to do with the patients that you're serving. You have stories that you overhear, you know, there, there are stories everywhere. And these are the stories that can make someone's eyebrows raise up and their bottoms scooch forward in their chair out of interest. That's mm -hmm. how you build that bridge. And I, I personally think that's how you build a bridge within a presentation. But I also think it's how you build a bridge when you're selling a service. You know, if you're sitting there trying to convince someone of the value of spending the big bucks for some kind of a service, right? For some sort of a, a procedure, let's say, that needs to occur, helping them, framing it for them in a story that humanizes it, that lets them see somebody else's success with this, can really help somebody step forward and take the leap. So walk us through what your process is like so that if somebody is really interested, and I know there's, a, there's going to be a lot of people that are really interested in public speaking, at some point in their career, maybe not early on, but at some point in their career, they're, they're going to either be mesmerized by it or have something to say and they want to get their passion out. So walk us through your process with us tough people. Well, the first question I always ask is who's going to be sitting in the seats? Because it starts there. You know, who are the people that you're serving? because your job is to be of service to them and of support to them using the gifts that you uniquely have. You must know who is in the seats. And I mean on a granular level, you know, from a demographic level, age range. And then go on, go on to the next question, which to me is, is, is everything. What are they struggling with? What are the challenges? What are the problems that they have to overcome? that you uniquely can help them with? That's the second question. And once you've figured that out, then you can do perhaps one of the most important things of all. Figure out what I call your intention, what you're there to do in service to that audience based on who they are and what they're struggling with. It's your purpose, it's the big fat why. It drives the presentation, it's everything. Once you know that, then you can, you can basically hammer out the rest of the bones of the fish is what I call it. I have a little fishbone methodology that I use, my fabulous fishbone methodology. And um, the way that I look at it is this, you gotta, you need a hanger to hang the clothes on. What I just described is the hanger. Very good, excellent, excellent feedback. So tell us a little bit of your background. Tell us something maybe that would surprise the audience about you. Well, I am a foreign service brat. 
Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, Daddy was a scientific attache for various embassies uh, abroad. And so I grew up, though I was born in Washington, D.C., I grew up in Paris and in Rome and then in Israel. I did not come back to the United States. I didn't come back to the country of my birth until I was almost 16. Wow. Yeah, this really, this shaped me in so many respects. I bet that was fascinating. Oh, it was great. Yeah. Now, did you live in downtown Paris? I did. In fact, I took my husband. Uh, I have a company that I work for that occasionally takes me overseas to give presentation skills trainings. And my husband and I went to Paris for the first time together. And I showed him where I lived. I found my apartment. My nose took me to my apartment. That's right near the Eiffel Tower, by the way. And uh, that was my, we used to play in a park right near the Eiffel Tower. That was my little, you know, <laughs> that was my backyard. That was where the yard was because it was very urban. Oh my gosh. It brings back such memories for me. So my daughter, I don't know if you know this about me, but my daughter skated at a world level when she was in junior high and high school. Oh, I did not know this. Yeah. So we spent a fair amount of time uh, traveling all over Europe. And I think during the course of time that she was skating, we were in France nine times. Oh, wow. Typically, we'd go to Rouen, and um, so it was northern France, but we would always go in early and spend days in Paris. And I have to tell you, I have such great memories of those trips because we would just go from cafe to cafe starting with breakfast, then moving on to lunch, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to dinner. And in between, we'd, you know, we'd do the sightseeing tours and, and photograph and do all these great things, maybe taking a museum here and there. But oh my gosh, I just have the best memories. What a wonderful thing to have been able to do with your, with your daughter, you know, mm -hmm. and how, and you know, I, I, I say this with all my heart, I think there's nothing better than being able to see the world and expand your brain and remember that we are a part of such a, a large, diverse, interesting world and have so much in common. I could not agree with you more. I remember coming back from my first international trip and thinking, oh my gosh, and we thought our country was old. Some of these buildings were so ancient. I mean, you know, different areas of Austria we were in magnificent but so old I, you know budapest oh it just was amazing it was just amazing castles and and just seeing the size of them and thinking about the opulence that was part of the world back then just amazing absolutely amazing we are in our not even in our teens in this country by comparison no absolutely not we're still little babies <laughs> and I do think that they live a lifestyle that maybe now during this crisis that we're partaking in is much more realistic. And hopefully we can start thinking that way. You know, they only buy what they need for dinner that night. The market, the outdoor markets in Rouen were unbelievable. Incredible. Yeah. And the food was delicious. Even clothing, you know, choosing to wear clothing that is of really good quality, having a few really good pieces instead of just a bunch of throwaway pieces you'll wear for one season, you know, or 800 pairs of shoes. Instead, just, you know, a handful of gorgeous shoes that you wear and resole. It's that way of thinking. And I think you're right. I think we are now going to remember what it's like, or maybe we re connect for the first time with what it's like to live that way. And become part of the community, right? Because right. when you were in the outdoor market, you, you saw everybody in your neighborhood. You saw everybody in your community on a day-to-day -day basis because that's what you did. You, you went out and you went to the cafes and you met each other and you hung out and just talked. And I do believe that, you know, this has been a moment of reflection for at least, you know, myself and my family that, you know, okay, we got to stop this craziness yeah and, i think we're all when we come through this we will be changed we will be changed and i think i think for the good i'm believing that that's what's getting me through that's what's getting me through i do too 
So what is the single best piece of advice that you ever received and from whom? I've received some fantastic pieces of advice from many wonderful mentors over the years, but the one that really steered me in the right direction was from Jim Barnhill, my acting teacher from Brown University. He was one of my first mentors. And when I graduated or was graduating, he knew that I was debating whether or not to go to Los Angeles or New York to ply my hand at the craft of acting. And he, he said these words to me. He said, Eleni, you have a really good head on your shoulders. Trust your gut. Trust knowing what's right for you and attach yourself to good people. That was his advice. That advice steered me through some really icky, weird scenarios, especially early on. I heeded that advice. It's one of the reasons that I am so lucky in terms of the people that I count in my life who are as my friends, my mentors, my coaches, my teachers. I have done that since he suggested it, and I will do it till the day I die. That's great advice. Tell us a little bit more about your acting career. You know, was it a long journey? Did Obviously, it's a tough journey. I do know that. I fell in love with the stage when I saw a production of Fiddler on the Roof at my high school in Israel when I was in seventh grade. I had already been a little diva from birth. I was one of those kids. I sang. I loved to dance. I have a report card from my French school that says that I had, I was naturally, had great kind of natural rhythm, you know, and and, um, at summer camp in Israel, I got up and sang a song all by myself for the talent show. And I got my very first, yes, a song called Frog Went a Courtin, and I got applause I mean, I got audience participation, and that was it for me. I thought, ooh, I like this. Also, a very cute boy asked me to sit next to him after that, and I thought, well, this is pretty great. It's like, (laughs) applause and cute boys. This is a good thing. So um, I was always interested in it. You know, it pulled me. And my mother used to call me as a little girl, Tallulah, or Tallulah Bankhead, who was a famous dramatic actress. Oh, I, was, I love that. Yeah, she'd say, what now, Tallulah? I was very dramatic. I, I, everything was very important, and I'm very emotional. And long story short, I was lucky. I got the good, I got the good parts, you know, in junior high and high school. And um, eventually, when I finally decided where to go to college, In fact, I'll tell you this, I had to choose between Boston University's School of Theater, which was a really big deal at the time. They took a very small group of people after an audition, 60 maybe, and Brown University for liberal arts education. I know, but I wanted to go to BU really badly because it was a professional theater program. Very long story short, I wound up at Brown and it was great. However, when I exited Brown, having been fortunate enough to get some great lead parts, I stepped into New York and discovered that everyone else who was there had all gotten the lead parts and they were their hometown's star and it was really competitive. And of course, I I just hadn't really experienced that before. And I'm six feet tall and exotic and dark. Ethnic is what they would call it. And I didn't easily fit in. Most of the guys were chest high to be blunt. Even a lot of the movie stars that we know and love, they're not exactly long drinks of water. And I was. And it was infuriating. Plus, I was strong. You know, I was not a little wuss. And the parts, the parts that I did get were parts that required that kind of presence and authority that my height and my general demeanor allowed for. But honestly, there weren't as many of them as I wanted or needed. And I was frustrated. So I wound up, ultimately, when I moved to Los Angeles, after frustration out there also, just everything I would get small parts or, you know, it just wasn't enough. I wanted stuff to chew on. I finally 
began to write songs again. I hadn't done that since I was a young girl, really, in my early teens. And um, I began to write songs. And the songs gave me voice and expression. And soon the songs were writing me. I couldn't stop writing songs. And I, I created so many of them that I thought, maybe, maybe they've got something here. And that shifted my whole life. I moved from being an obsessive actress to being an obsessive singer and songwriter. And that allowed me to establish myself, take charge in my life. I created my own production company. I put myself on tour. I got in a car, I drove around the country. I, I recorded four CDs. I mean, it was a cottage industry that I could control. And it's really what led me ultimately to the work that I do today. That is an amazing story. How cool is that? Yeah, well, you know. Talk it, a little bit about being in a profession. So, you know, one of the goals and the visions that I have, obviously, for this podcast is to inspire younger women, not only in the field of dentistry, but, you know, interested in the field of dentistry mm -hmm. and what it takes in order to be successful. And being strong women we don't always fit in. And I, I can say that with very strong clarity. However, in order for us to be successful, you can't compromise on that. So tell me a little bit about how you were able to overcome some of that and still stay true to yourself. Because I think that's the thing that, that makes the difference is you have to stay true to who you are as a person. Yeah, this was my big shift. And it happened as a result of, uh, to be very frank, a couple of top level acting teachers in New York. I was raised to be a pleaser, you know, and I know, I know that you know what I'm talking about here. And a lot of the women who may be listening may understand this, you know, constantly trying to make nice, wanting other people to like me, you know, the people pleasing to, to such a degree that I was basically giving away really essential parts of myself to make somebody else feel better or look better. I call that being a parts car. And um, it was hurting me as an actress. I didn't even know that. I took a class in New York, my first professional acting class, did my first professional acting class scene. And Warren Robertson, my teacher, after I was done, he asked me how I thought it went. And I said, well, you know, I thought it went pretty, pretty well. I mean, I, I was, had a little bit of an out-of-body experience, and it was stressful. But, you know, I did what I did. He said, Eleni, I disagree. To be honest, I was disappointed. And for me, that's like kryptonite. That's like the worst word you could ever use, you know. He said, you know why? For one thing, you were making Saturday morning cartoon faces, but we'll deal with that later. For another, where were you? It's as if you were playing the idea of this character without showing us who you are without showing us what you know, without bringing your perspective and life experience into it. He said, we want to know from you. Dare to be you, he said. And you know, I was so floored by that because mostly I didn't even know how to do that. I didn't trust or believe that revealing myself was the way to go. I felt that if I really showed up and let people see what was inside, Somehow or other, they would see that I just, you know, like so many of us, I was a fraud. It wouldn't, it wasn't enough. You know, all of the things that stop us. It took me several years of working with him and another acting teacher who really was it for me, Michael Howard, to begin to take the risk to show up, stop trying to please, focus on doing the work that the scene required bring my colors of my palette, if you will, to it, and not care whether someone liked it or didn't like it. And in auditions, I had to learn to stop caring whether someone liked me or didn't like me, or even gave me the job. I learned to focus on doing my job, bringing what I had, and then leaving. I'll tell you, this is why I do the work I do. Because I mean, it's it. It's everything. This is it. For women in particular, 
Oh my gosh, it, you're singing my tune because that level of unworthiness that most women feel, I don't know where that comes from. And I don't know why we have it, but we do. And, you know, even at my age, there are moments in my life I can recognize them now and I can shake myself out of it. But younger women don't necessarily understand what's happening. And going back to your story about your teacher and first getting into New York and trying to please people, I too suffered from the same thing and had worked for several men in leadership roles, not, not in the field of dentistry, but in the, in the restaurant industry before I, I started in dentistry. And I was a hard worker and, and they realized it and capitalized on that. But I was in several compromising situations and I know you, what you, you know what I mean. And the, oh, I do. And I know that world and I know that world. I worked in it too. Exactly. And you, you know, I was very fortunate to get out before, you know, my gut told me, get out, get out, get out before anything were, were to happen to me. But it is amazing what we don't understand and how easily manipulated younger women can be. And I, I think if we could do anything to inspire them to think before they they get themselves into a compromising situation. And I do know that many women today, you know, are growing up with strong moms. Like I, I know I would never have to worry about my daughter because my, my daughter would probably guys <laughs> black, you, <No>. know? <laughs> you know, because I brought her up with the understanding that, you know, these things should never happen to you. Period end of conversation. And you should never allow anybody to make you feel bad because that somebody else portraying their insecurities on you, not the other way around. And I, I think if we could find a way to teach young women those concepts early on, that we'd have so much stronger women out there. And I know I, that I, I agree. Yeah. I know environment plays a lot into it, but gosh, I wish we could just shake some girls and say, don't do that. You know? Well, you know, I really think that, some of this has been baked into us. We've been in a, a one down power position since practically the beginning of time. You know, we have been basically told that we are worth less. We are given that information on a daily basis in many ways, some subtle and some not. We've been objectified, we've been treated poorly, we've been, we've been hurt or even killed for talking back, speaking up, standing out. We've been penalized for doing things that aren't, quote, appropriate, you know, over the years, over the generations, we are learning. And it's hard to hold up those boundaries. I work with a lot of women and um, it's a special, you know, for me, that's a place that's very special for me. I'm on, you know, I feel like I'm in my legacy years now and, and I love to work with both men and women, but I am especially devoted to helping women not only find their voice, but have the courage to put it out there. And I mean, not simply in on a public speaking platform, which I think is essential, by the way. We need more women on speaking platforms, virtual or otherwise, period. More women's voices. But I also feel we need more women's voices in boardrooms where decisions are being made. And we need women to help themselves stop doing some very simple things like second guessing themselves uh, constantly, you know, stopping themselves from speaking out if it doesn't seem like it's perfect yet. You know, we need to learn to be messy. <laughs> we need to learn to take risks. We need to learn to dive in because men do this all the time. Yeah, they're fine. They're always at the table. And many times we sit in the back of the room. And why do we sit in the back of the room? You know, I mean, Sheryl Sandberg wrote a whole book on that. Why do we sit in the back of the room? Sit at the table, girls. Exactly. We have to decide to sit at the table first. And then we have, to, we have to find the courage to do it. And sometimes it just, you know, just, you know, speaking up once is better than not speaking up at all. That's what I always say. Give it a shot, you know, give it a shot. But, but I want to say something else, too. For those of us who are building businesses, it's damn hard. Those of us in the world 
just trying to make something of ourselves, it's hard. Those of us who are in worlds where we can sometimes come face to face with absolute obvious sexism and misogyny and all of those things, you know, that makes it even worse. You know, we have to learn to know what those boundaries are for ourselves and we have to do the scary thing and hold those boundaries. And it's not easy. I, I think back, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think back to <laughs> the restaurant jobs I had, because remember I was an actress. I think back to how many times, the, the, you know, the, the Me Too moments, I made a list. It, it went on forever. I have stories that will curl your toes. And, and I was pretty good at stopping, at nipping things in the bud. But I remember a circumstance I was in, and it, this did not occur to me, it happened to a younger woman, and this addresses what you were saying. I think the older women really do need to be able to mentor as much as possible around this. Because sometimes someone who's very young, and I'm thinking of an 18-year-old now, who was right. in a play with me in Pittsburgh. There were a lot of older men in this play, probably maybe five who had leading parts. And every day, this young woman would come in. She was adorable. She was buxom and curvy and very, very naive. And every day, they would do two things. They would stand her next to them and have her be the butt of a joke, you know, like a, like a blonde joke. And then they would insist that she kiss every one of them, hello. And when I discovered this, I was in my early 30s and there was another woman who was uh, a little older than I was. We took it upon ourselves to sit her down and say, it is not in your contract to kiss these men or be the butt of a joke. And we gave her some suggestions on how to handle it. She had no clue. Right. She thought it was probably expected, yeah, right? And she was afraid to say no, like so many of us. We, we told her if it continued, we would go, uh, we would actually take action around it. We would go to the, what's called the equity deputy, who's the person who is uh, the, the union representative. We told her that we would intervene, but we also gave her some suggestions on how to manage it. And she was so relieved. I'll never forget this. I've thought of her a million times and wondered how she's fared in the world, you know? It takes grit to do that. It takes, it takes being willing to not be liked. It takes being willing to have someone look at you and go, you take things too seriously. You have no sense of humor. You're just like every other girl. Just like every other girl. Think you're better than everybody. Oh, my God. <laughs> you and I could talk all day about this. Oh, we could. We could. Absolutely. Plenty of stories. Plenty of stories. One piece of advice that you would give them, you know, just we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. One piece of advice that you would give them. One piece of advice that I would strongly suggest. Trust yourself. As women in particular, we tend to look outside for affirmation. It's not to say, don't go and get advice from great people. That is fine and good. But learn to begin to trust what you know is right for you. I wish I had done that earlier in my life. I would tell that to my younger self. Trust yourself. Know what you know and know that it's enough. And we are enough just the way we are. Whatever age we are at, wherever we are in our life, whatever our experiences are, we are enough. And in that moment in time, that is all that matters. And I, you know, and then I know that that doesn't come for many years and with wisdom it comes, but an experience, but oh my gosh, I wish I could just you know, like put it in a, a little dropper and have them drink it or something, you know, <laughs> just so that we could get it to them earlier. Because, you know, goodness gracious, nobody wants to go through some of those experiences. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone that I know to go through some of those experiences. I know sure. me neither. I wouldn't wish them on anybody. I know. All right, let's, let's go to something fun. Let's go to something else. Is there anybody in dentistry who inspires you that you've met so far? Yes. There are so many. I bet. And there are two in particular. One of them is um, 
my client and pal, Susan Cotton. Oh, yeah. I love this woman. I mean, I, I just have to tell you, I have so many amazing clients. I love them all. They, I consider them to be my pals. I, I bring Susan up because Susan is, Susan had, she began to have some issues with her ability to work as a hygienist and from, because of physical issues that came up mm -hmm. for her. And here she was suddenly looking at a life without being able to do her life's work. And so she reinvented herself, if you will. She decided that she would go out there and pursue her passion to help hygienists remember the power they have to detect oral cancer. And when I first started working with her, she was just making this shift. And you know, it was scary, but this woman, launched herself in with both feet and her big heart. And I have enjoyed watching her just seize the world with it. She's doing great. And she, to me, represents what I see a lot of, by the way, in my estimation, in the dentistry world, especially from a speaker standpoint. People who, who really have this life experience that they just want to share because they know they can make a difference. And they have a certain expertise or a certain perspective that could potentially save somebody's life or make someone smile brighter or make someone's work easier. She is the epitome of that in my estimation. She's one. Now I'm gonna to refer to another one and I'm, I'm looking at that other one, okay? Now I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. First of all, you know, I like you enormously and I like you for a lot of reasons. You're smart and you're capable and you know what you do is you allow, you bring people together in, in large groups and you've done this since many forms in your life. You are what I call a way shower. You're someone who is trying to, to point people in the right direction so that they can, they can bring themselves more fully to their lives. You do it in every aspect of your work. When we, the coronavirus hit, you, you punted and went, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put a couple of virtual platforms together that will allow me to have people like Eleni come and share their wisdom so that I can be of use and help to help the students that I love, to help the women I wanna support. I admire that. I think it is it because I really think that the world needs more people like you. And I wanna say this to the women who are listening. We need more women who are mentors. I see you as a mentor. It's just part and parcel of who you are. And you do it with this effortless grace and you do it the way you, you are you. This is what I, why I honestly fell in love with you. You are who you are, who you are, who you are. Or as my auntie from uh, Lowell, Massachusetts would say, you are who you are, who you are. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's what I love about you. And it's because <laughs> what I'm trying to activate or actualize in the clients that I work with. And to me, you represent that. And, you, and you're doing it on a large, a large, ever-growing platform. You have moxie, you know? You take risk. And, and I admire that. You're a risk taker. Well, I didn't think that was where that was going to go, but thank you. No. I'm like, <laughs> I know you did. I'm so touched. On, thank you. I, I am touched. You asked. Now I'm sp speechless. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> don't you edit that out. Uh, okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So who helped you most get to where you are today? So from a business standpoint, mm. you know, what has made the, the biggest difference for you in your professional career, where you are today. You know, we, you've told us a little bit about your acting, but who's made the biggest difference for where you are today? Hands down, my coach, Mark LeBlanc. Hands down. I've been working with Mark since, what, 2005? We are now buddies. He and his wife and my husband, are, we, go, we vacation together. We're really close. <laughs> but he met me when I was just beginning... I had started my, my coaching business, but I met him when I was making the transition from being a singer and songwriter to being a, a coach and, and trainer and speaker. I had been a coach at that point for, I think now, uh, three years, 
And I was out there doing, um, I was still performing and I had a one woman show for young girls called The Tallest Poppy. And I was helping, trying to help them achieve the best that they could be. It was based around a song that I wrote called The Tallest Poppy about a little poppy in a field who went against the rule of, of the land, the law of the land. She grew past the limit sign, even though it was tough and, and you know, the bugs bit her and, you know, other flowers turned their backs on her. She kept growing to be everything she could be. And, and all these other little baby, these little baby poppies followed suit. The song birthed a show, one woman show, and it also birthed a workshop for young girls in middle school. And I was trying to figure out a way to really take this to a larger platform, you know, and I found out about something called the National Speakers Association. And lo and behold, I was led to Mark LeBlanc. I was told if you really want to help yourself, take this to the next level. You should work with him. Mark is the one who helped me take that presentation and ultimately shift it into a signature keynote, my first signature keynote called um, Touch the Sky for Adults. And he helped me make the shift from being a performer to being a, a professional speaker. He helped me think like a business professional. Though I want to say all those years of running my own, um, I, I really kind of had the a lot of the chops. I was a pretty good business person as an actress, and I learned to be even better at it, uh, running my own, um, you know, uh, if you will, my own CD and, uh, you know, recording arm. And he cemented for me daily habits that helped me be very disciplined about my approach to building my business. It changed my life and my work and my reach. I now am able to reach so many more people. I mean, it's just a wonderful, and I, I work with him still and look forward to those sessions and implement the things that we discuss. Oh my gosh, uh, that's amazing story. I had no idea that you even had any of this in your background, the tallest poppy. Oh, yes. Oh my gosh, no wonder you could talk so freely and expressively about it. That's amazing. Yeah, I that song really was key to me. It, you know, it's really interesting. I say this, when you get older, like I am, <laughs> by the day. I know. We, know, we both know that. You know, you have the advantage of looking backwards and seeing what I call the light motif, that little recurring theme that pops up in your life, where that connects one thing to the next, you know? I have always, always, since I was a little kid, always been interested in I have always seen the best in people. I've always wanted them to sort of blossom into the best that they could be. You know, my motto, if you will, you know, my, like if I had a bumper sticker, it would say, be you, aim high. Uh, this is what I believe. This is who I am. And the tallest poppy song epitomized it when I wrote it. And it kicked off this entire new chapter in my life. So I find it really interesting to see my struggle has become, really, I took that struggle, turned it inside out like a sock and made something of it. You know, I, be, I believe that that's what we're here to do too. I mean, I think that we run into issues, problems and challenges so we can look them in the eye and go, okay, what do you have to teach me? What can I do in the face of this? I, th this pandemic is a phenomenal example of that without a doubt. There's always a silver lining and there are no coincidences in the world. Everything happened. I believe everything happens for a reason. So whatever that reason is, it may be way beyond my comprehension at the time. But when I go forward in my life, if I reflect back and say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I didn't do that. You know, whatever that might be, because Further down the road, there's always something better or another road that you went down that that would never fit in. So I do believe that there is a silver lining in every single thing that we do, always. I do too. And you know, again, with a perspective of age, you can really see that. But I believe everyone can take a breath, take a look and see and look for that, you know? 
I really do. I, I would never, had I not been a singer songwriter, traveled to Jacksonville, Florida to a music conference, stepped into a cab that I had to share with two other people because there were no cabs apparently at the Jacksonville airport and Uber wasn't born yet and sat next to a man with very blue eyes, a nice smile and a good sense of humor, turned out to be the man I would marry after swearing I would never get married again. I would never have wound up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a place I didn't even know existed. I, I'm a left and right coast kind of gal, so I didn't even know where this was. In a household with teenage boys who were not mine, who became mine, where I have lived since 2000 and really since 2002. Wow. I would never have been here. I would never have probably started the business that I started. So how grateful am I? And, and you know, when I look back at it, I think how grateful am I that I struggled as an actress? How grateful that I had to find my voice and find my power pushing against that struggle so that everything could happen to bring me to this moment, to this moment right now, in fact, with you and me, to you and me, right? I would never have met you. And that would have been a loss as far as I'm concerned. So- And, and, you know. and mutual, I, I think the world of you, and, and I am so glad our paths have met. I know this is not gonna be the last little endeavor that we work on, that is for yeah, sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Who's made the biggest impact on your life? Is there any particular person or is it always been all of these moments, like the culmination of all of them? I have to say, without even thinking about that, it was my mom. Tell us a little bit about her. Yeah. Let me tell you about mommy, Teresa. Oh my gosh, that's my mom's name. Oh yes, with an H. T-H-E-R-S-A. Oh, oh. Got a lot more in common. Oh, we do. Your middle name is not Maria, is it? <laughs> no. No, okay, well, all right, so we, we struck out there. My mother was a visual artist and one of the most creative people I ever met. She could look at something and figure out how to make it better, you know? She was a, a painter, oil painter, a sculptor. Uh -huh. She made interesting, almost three-dimensional collages with embroidery and fabric. She, she, she made anything and everything fun and creative. She was like a child in a grown-up's body. One day in the kitchen, while we were sitting at the Formica tabletop, you know, she handed me a felt tip pen. Well, she, she drew a horse, first of all, a big horse, massive cartoon horse on the table, handed me the pen and said, draw something on it. I drew a bra. Yeah, you know. <laughs> my mother drew, you know, a little like garter belt and stockings. And then we went to town. I mean, this this horse had eyelashes and I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you can only imagine. Oh and then, my know, gosh, that's hysterical. On the table in the kitchen. And then you know what she did that was so great? She left it there. She left it there till it was time for dinner and then she was worried that if we would eat and it would get all over us, but there it was, it was our masterpiece. She made me believe, she had more belief in me as a person and in what I could create. She was my biggest fan. Whatever I wanted to do, she, she'd look at me and go, yes, go, honey. She'd love to brainstorm with me. I, she passed away from dementia a year after I came to Michigan. And I'll tell you something, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't miss her. I don't miss that spirit and I don't miss the collaborate collaboration that we had. You know, she was a large life force who made me believe that I, if I could see it in my head, I could create it. It's why I, I am a creator and I'm a project starter and finisher largely because of her. You know, it's amazing how much our moms can inspire us, isn't it? A day doesn't go by. I don't miss my mom either. I mean, just. When did she pass away? 2015. And so it's been about five years. And I will say that, you know, as growing up, she was my best friend. And there isn't a moment in time where I don't remember something wonderful that she would say to encourage me, move me forward, 
you can do this. You know, I remember going home and, and telling my parents at 35 years old that I was going to go back to dental school. I had always <laughs> known that I was going to go to dental school. That's a story for another day, but I didn't go uh, right away. And so my daughter was five and my, my daughter's first day of kindergarten was, was my first day of dental school. And I had to tell my parents, I didn't tell anybody that I had even applied. And my mom's first response was, okay, what do you need us to do? You know, like just, what do you need us to do? We'll take care of Courtney. We'll, you know, we'll get, what do you need us to do? And, and that was her spirit always, you know, if she was cooking, she was cooking for a hundred people all the time. Because <laughs> that's just The more the merrier, let's bring in the whole town, who cares, you know, and it's just that spirit of them. Now, did your mom have a lot of confidence? Is that how you developed so much assertiveness and confidence at a young age? It's interesting that you ask me that because my mother did not, she was practically the top of her class in high school. Wow. But she did not go on to college because it was wartime. And, you know, I think she always felt a little less than, you know, my father did go, he went to MIT as a matter of fact. And my mother, I think always felt a little bit, little sort of not quite up to snuff. And, oh, I want to say that for a long time in my life with my mom, when she was with us, my brother and me, she was sometimes different than she was with my dad. She was more deferential with him. She was, she would allow him to sort of shush her up at times. I saw those things and it really bothered me. And when my dad got sick with Parkinson's and he got sick when I was 16, right when he retired from foreign service, he was sick for almost 20 years. My mother took care of him. Oh gosh. And it was during those 20 years that I saw my mother begin to step up to the plate. And I know this is going to sound so weird, but the weaker my father got, the stronger my mother became. She had it in her to run Chrysler, this woman, but she never had the chance to do it. But she ran their home and, and, and like a tight ship. She took care of that man. She took care of everything, you know, and she became the one to make the decisions. She took over and I watched that change. But I've got to be honest and tell you that growing up, I was hugely conflicted. I was strong. I talked back. I got in trouble for it, particularly with my dad. I came from a Greek background. Girls and boys were raised differently. Yes, I had confidence on one level. I did. I really did. I was raised to believe in myself. On the other hand, I was also raised to second guess myself wow. because I was a female. I really was given the direction, you know, yes, go to school, get a good education. But you know what? You're probably going to get married when you come out of it. And, you know, there was a part of me that learned to acquiesce really early, especially to men. And so that was really fighting the part of me that was had a pretty good spine, you know. <laughs> but over the years, the work that I did as an actress, the more I've said this a million times because I talk about confidence especially with women, I believe confidence is an inside job. So you have to work it from the inside out. You have to manage those limiting beliefs. Or as I, I say, mo and schmo, the little um, judges on your shoulder, that's what I call them, who are beating you up, you know, and saying things like, you're, you're not as educated. No one's going to take you seriously. And things like that. You have to be able to manage the self-talk you have to you have to reframe those beliefs you have to do the work to help yourself be more ready allow yourself to see what you've got going for you and build on those skill sets you know it is it takes work and we have to do that work now that said i i, I say this is what i say you know preparation builds confidence Confidence builds what I call transformational presence, presence, taking up that space without apology. Those in those three, what I call the three presence planes, your, your physical presence, right? The meat suit that is yours to inhabit. You know, are you inhabiting it in a sense of, with a sense of ownership without apology? 
the voice that you're using? Are you speaking in a way that commands attention, that is adult, authoritative, inviting, uh, and, and that energetic presence, your energetic pr presence that's defined by what you believe about yourself. Those mm -hmm. inner voices can make that pres that that vibe that you put out either push people away or pull them to you. And that's where you have to do that inner work. If you're not, if in, if in the inside, you don't feel good enough, no matter what you put on the outside of yourself, no matter the clothes you wear, the schools you go to, or you know any of the external trappings will not, will not help you feel that strong sense of inner self and security. People sniff it out as if it was cologne. I mean, they can just sense it. And it's amazing how people will take advantage of that, especially the people I call bullies, right? You know, there's that, that personality that will, because of their own insecurity, will beat you up to make you back off before they lose ground. That's right. Um, but it's their own unworthiness or insecurity that makes them portray themselves like that. That's exactly right. Unbelievable. Great three P's. I love that. Yeah. That's a, you know, to me, that's everything. When I'm that notion of transformational presence is a really mm -hmm. big part of my work. Um, what I believe about that is that we're meant to exude our natural magnetic Charisma, which is the same thing as this transformational presence. It just means life force. You know, we're all born with it. And, but the problem is when we start, you know, when we're little, we're not worried about people liking us or, or trying to please them. We're just being, you know, we're examining our toes and making little spit bubbles. And, and people are fascinated by us without us trying to fascinate them. But then we start moving out into the world and we get a lot of feedback that starts to make us question ourselves or play small. You know, even a small thing like, I hear this a lot when I'm out. Well, someday when I get to go to a restaurant again, I'm sure I'll hear it. You know, when a little child is there, a parent will say, use your indoor voice. And all of a sudden, you're mitigating yourself. You're making yourself smaller. Right. And as a result, that transformational presence that may, is made up of those three presence planes it just gets a little smaller, a little more tentative. So we have to we have to go against that. In a sense, we really have to encourage ourselves to light ourselves up from the inside out. I can't agree with you more. There's a I think there's a great quote. I think it's Marianne Williamson says, "Oh yes, it is because it's right on my desk." Ah, see? <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I'm so glad that I I knew who it was. Um, you don't do a service to the world by playing small. That's exactly you don't. right. You just don't. You have to, you have to be there 150 percent and play full out because that's what we're here for. That's exactly right. And we are, as she said, you know, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Right. Right. You know, we're afraid of our own power. As women, we've also been told not to be powerful. We've mm -hmm. been told our place is not to be powerful. Right. And we are afraid of that word. Uh, it's like women are afraid to be assertive because they think it's being aggressive. There are two different things, you know? Totally agree. Totally you know, agree. Assertion, assertion uh, being assertive is asking for what you need and want, period. I mean, really, when it comes down to it. Absolutely you're not trying to step over a boundary with another human being. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, you know, life, life and work. And look, 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 that was going to say, they give us such incredible opportunity to exercise all of these moments of, of imperfection and, you know, and, and learning and growth and development. And we are right now, I mean, in this world that we're living in right now, if we were avoiding ourselves before, we are now having to come face to face with ourselves and our fears and our insecurities and our, you know, in ways that we could never have foreseen. We are having to be alone very often and at a loss for what to do. And our work is being affected, you know, and again, it's like the opportunities abound 
Right. Right. Abound. The question then becomes, what can you do? Do with this moment in time. That's right. Exactly. So tell me about, have you ever had one of those aha moments that you just realized, oh my gosh, I'm doing exactly what I thought I should be doing all this time? Yes. In fact, I have to say, I have them a lot actually with my clients. It's, it's when my clients have a breakthrough moment, but there's one really big moment. It's, it's a seminal moment for me. And um, it happened when I was had really taken steps forward fully into my career as a singer and songwriter. And I had, for the very first time, I had put together a CD. I had a, a real honest to God CD. I had just, the, the thousand copies of it had just arrived at my, at my home actually in Los Angeles in boxes. You know, this was a huge effort. I, as I said, it was finding my voice, the voice that would lead me to the work I'm doing now. So it was that important. And it was um, St. Patrick's Day, and my husband and I were sitting at home, my then husband, and I was in my jammies, and I was at my new computer, brand new computer, wow. and uh, color screen. This was a long time ago, very exciting, when all of a sudden there was an explosion, and the lights went out. And my computer, imagine that the computer almost imploded, the screen almost imploded. And I... I thought, what the heck? And, and then all of a sudden I smelled smoke and I realized, oh my God, there is a fire. There's a fire. There were flames and fire licking at a wall in our home. <gasps> I yelled to my husband. I yelled, get the cat, my cat, Cassie. I saw her slink by and I knew what she was doing. I knew she was going to run to the bedroom and go under the bed, right? And hide. And I said, get the cat. And then I ran outside and I saw that there are... The side of our building, our electrical conduit was in flames and our, one of our neighbors was trying to put it out with a garden hose. Long story short, it took what felt like eons, eons for the fire department to get there. We didn't have cell phones at the time. None of the neighbors would open their doors to me. When I finally found someone who called the fire department for me, they went to the wrong place Ugh. By the time they got back, they had to just let the flames shoot to the roof of our place. And my cat was still under the bed. Ugh. And what I recall is they brought the kitty out. You know, they finally found the kitty and tried to resuscitate her. And I knew she was gone. And the, there were people surrounding us. That it was a, apparently a very, a day with very little news. Because all, there were all sorts of reporters there taking our picture as we stood in our jammies sobbing over our cat. It was very, very horrible. And when we finally were able to step back into the house the day after, you know, into our apartment, beautiful apartment that I loved, most of it was ruined, except for the room where I had my music. My guitars, the boxes of CDs were unscathed. Oh my goodness. And I thought, wow. And I, and I realized that I had a performance to do in three days. And, you know, I could have, if I'd wanted to, I could have gotten out of it, right? I mean, I had a great excuse, but the show must go on. That's where I come from. Mm -hmm. And I went to that. I strapped my guitar on that night, and I went, and I got on that stage, and I gave a show like I've probably never given before or since. I was one raw human. Mm -hmm. I cried. I shared my story. The audience was with me 100%. When I was done, they gave me a standing ovation. I remember that because I, you know, picked up my stuff and went back to my home away from home, the spare room at my friend Brigetta's house. The following morning, I opened up my laptop and there was a message from someone and he said, hi, you don't know me. I'm a performance poet. And I want you to know that I've had a really hard time of it for the last two years. And last night was the night that I had thought, I'm going to take my life. I was resolved. And I walked home. And as I was walking home, I passed this little coffee shop, you know, 
that I'd passed a million times and I heard this voice coming out of there. And something made me go in and then I sat and I listened to you as you just poured your heart out of there. And I thought, if Eleni can go through what she went through, if she can reveal herself to us in all her pain and still keep going, then I can too. So thank you, Eleni, for saving my life. Oh my gosh. And then he wrote a poem for me that I still have. It's one of my you know, all-time favorite possessions. In that moment, I knew that I was doing the right thing. I have felt that way in big ways and small ways pretty much ever since. The last part of my life involving my music, morphing into my tallest poppy show, moving into speaking, doing keynotes for large groups, doing trainings, doing coaching, you know, writing books, all of the things that I'm doing now. I have these moments with people where they come up to me and they say, thank you. It's as if you, those words that you said, I needed to hear them today. Or, oh my God, thank you. I went and did my presentation and I knocked it out of the park. Or, oh my God, I got the gig. I went into the interview. I showed up. I was ready. All our work paid off. I got the job. Ugh. See, for me, that's it. And, and that's the big shift for me in my life. I stopped wanting the so-called glamour, if you will, of being center stage and the attention being on me, it shifted to being of service. That's been the biggest shift. So that's why that stuff matters so much to me and will matter to me till the day I die. Oh my gosh. How fabulous. Long answer. Long answer that's to your okay. question. But. That was a great answer. Oh my gosh. I mean, seriously, that was a great answer. Oh my gosh. I, um, I imagine, you know, there's not many people that can say that they've made an impact on somebody's life like that. I mean, you know, really, you, you just, you saved somebody's life just by being you. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, if I could say anything about what I want young women to know is, is never say you're sorry for anything. Oh, gosh. Because, you know, that's... There's nothing to be sorry for. We're not perfect. We are who we are and we should come the way we are because somebody else is going to be inspired by that. That's exactly right. And you never know whose life you, you're going to touch by that encouraging remark, by sharing that bit of wisdom or your perspective. That's why I think it's so important to find the courage to do it. You know, I mean, if you don't do it, think of the lives Think of the people who needed exactly what you had to say or teach. Really, I mean, that's it to me. I think it's everything. It's, it's, it's why I think we're here as humans, in our, each in our own way. And we've all been given these gifts that we're fortunate enough to have that we get to harness in service to that. You know, I just find it so fascinating. I had no idea about any of your background. We connected immediately as soon as we met. And my vision for this is spot on with what you're, you have done in your past. And you have contributed so much to this, this episode because it's exactly where I wanted to go. So thank you for that. Oh my God. You are as welcome as, as you could be. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Tell me a little bit about how you relieve stress. Cause you know, we all have our moments of stress and, you know, I'm trying to find ways all the time <laughs> to relieve stress. And I just fascinated by what helps you. Well, high on my list is reading and reading, not reading self-help books, which I'm yeah, like a million of them, you know, or business books. I'm talking about books that let me escape. I love kind of Books about, I'm serious, I'm just going to reveal myself to all, but I love books about vampires and, and like time travelers. And I like book series. I also like just fantastic literature, beautifully written. So I like to get immersed in a big fat book and thank God for my Kindle because it'll, I can do it at night when my husband's asleep next to me. That's one that's huge for me. And it always has been. 
the other one for me is, well, right now it's walking. Uh, working out is important to me. Uh, we have a health club that is killing me not to be able to go. I love, it's a community of people and I love these people. We do a circuit training and I love it. They're now going to give me a training to do at home, which I'm excited about because, you know, sitting on my tush day in and day out like this is not good. Jim and I have been really enjoying our walks. We've been walking every day in our masks, which I have made. I'm very proud of my masks. Excellent. Sewing has been something that I remember doing with my mom. We sewed our clothes for years. And so I've been reconnecting with her, you know, in a sense, through the sewing, using her machine. And taking those walks and being in nature, that's been even more important than it's ever been for me. So that's another thing. And I also really believe in, um, I believe in breathing. You know, I believe in mindfulness work. I, there's a couple of apps that I use to help me. One of them is one called Calm, which is I useful. Calm. I love Calm. And I also have Headspace. I have, they're two very, two very different ones and I like them both. And I kind of, I started with Headspace. Now what's Headspace? I've never heard of that one before. Yeah, it's similar to Calm. It's just not as visual, you know? What I like about Calm is it's got some choices for, you know, the, the rain lightly falling. The, I like that kind of a thing because I'm very visually oriented. But it's a very similar thing where you can do series of meditations depending on your needs. It, it can combat anxiety. It can even help you figure out how to fall asleep more easily. Or even they have some great little meditations to help you prepare your head, your body, for when you step into a presentation. <laughs> ah. So I believe in that. You know, I actually believe really, you don't need an app to do that. You know, you need to be willing to just calm yourself, you know, breathe in and out 10 times and take note of when, just follow the breath and think a word at the top of it, like calm or peace and then exhale and do it until you start to feel it. That's what I like to say. Just do it until you start to feel it. I have been struggling for the last two years to get into the habit of meditating and starting my day that way because I, I know that I'm an intense personality personally. <laughs> that It's just been the way I have been my entire life. And so, you know, I'm trying to not not modify that so much as to just have a way to release, you yes. know, and it's finally starting to kick in. I'm happy to say it's finally starting to kick in. It's been two weeks now and. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think that if I can get through the next two weeks, it should be, you know, they say what, 30 days in. in your yes. Habit. 30 days. Or I read somewhere it might even be 60. The point is to do it. And you know, I, I really, I believe five minutes is better than nothing. You know, but what we do, and this is where we get in trouble in our business and in our lives, is we have this big promise, you know, I'm going to meditate twice a day for 30 minutes. A no way is that going to happen. No. You know, so start with five minutes. If you can do that, then you mm -hmm. can build up. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the more you do it, the more you feel better. Oh, yeah. I, I also, oh, I was just going to say writing, uh, journaling. For years and years and years, I journaled. I have countless journals. Since I've been doing other kinds of writing, you know, like I'm writing my second book right now and I wrote songs for years, I shifted to where my, I stopped doing the journal writing and um, I've started to pick that back up again. It, it's good, you know, especially because my husband and I are sharing space here and I'm in, I process verbally and if I just keep coming at him, blah, 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 blah. That's not going to help either one of us. So having a space to just go, bleh, you know, and lay it out, just get up, write out what I'm feeling or thinking and let it go. That's helpful to me. I, I like journaling notes on my business and thoughts that I have because I hate to forget things. I have, you know, ideas just come to me, you know, it could be, I could be like out doing something and an idea will pop into my head and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to write that down. So I do try to keep a journal. I do have it in my phone. I know that other people like to hand write them, but I find that I have so many things come to me at, at different times that I like to write them down right then and there because I'm one of those people 
my head will be gone off us on some other tangent, so, you know, two seconds later and I'll never remember. But those are little gifts. And I, you know, this is the, this is the creative in me speaking, but when that happens, it's your job to go, Oh, capture it. You know, yeah, I, exactly. I have, uh, I use paper still. I'm st that's the only place where I still really use paper because I'm pretty paperless otherwise, but I have little pads of paper all over the house, including right near my bed and in the bathroom where my mate, you know, right near, right near my mirror, you know, just where I look at myself and pens and in the car. Well, I'm not that I'm driving much lately, but you know, but I'm immediately putting ideas down. And as a songwriter, that was critical. I'm sure if you didn't, you'd forget, you know, and now same thing. I'm constantly creating programs or, or I have ideas for clients, you know, if I'm helping them put together a keynote or something like that or a presentation, I start getting bombarded with ideas for them. And it's my job to capture these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it'll make it 10 times better. Oh, yeah. So tell us if you have a guilty pleasure or a secret dream. Oh, okay. Can I say both? Sure. All right. I scratched the itch of the guilty pleasure recently. Okay. One of my most favorite things on the planet is rice pudding, which, you know, it's really fattening and you know, oh blah, 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 and I don't eat a lot of dairy or sugar or blah, 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 blah. My mother had the best recipe on the planet. And about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I made a big vat of it. And then my husband and I ate that every night. I, I love it. So I even put cream in it. I mean, it's the most delicious thing in the world. I shared it with the people in my network. It's that good. And, you know, I think sometimes it's just really wonderful to let yourself indulge in something that just plain old makes you feel like a little kid. Cause that's what that does for me. Without a doubt. Yeah. And the other thing, yeah, you know what I always wanted to do? What? I always wanted to have to have a puppy farm. Oh. Yes, I love animals. And and now my kitty's in the room here, so my cat is trying to get me to go feed her dinner eventually, and she's been rubbing up against me. I'm a cat person now, but when I was a little girl, my brother was the cat person and I was the dog person. That's how we divided it up. And I used to dream of having like a, a place where I could have a million little puppies and I could go and smell their little bellies and like play with them all. And, you know, and so I'm still disgusting around little puppies or kittens or anything like that. It is one of my greatest joys to be around any little tiny fuzzy baby like that. I love them. I don't even know how to explain. I just turn into a five-year-old so there you have it, you know. Oh, I love them too. I, and as soon as you said, smell their belly, I could smell exactly what you were talking about. Little exactly. puppy smell. Oh, mm. this, it's just like, you know, there is a smell to little babies. There is. They do. And, and it's heaven. It's heaven. It's heaven. <sighs> I think they're designed that way so that we love them up. Considering what's coming out the other end, you see, that has to kind of, <laughs> there's got to be a balance. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So when you're having a bad day, how do you turn it around and keep your emotions from sucking you in? You know, there are times when you can get overwhelmed and yeah. it really, it can instantaneously change your mood. And I know, I mean, I've had experiences even with patients in the chair where you know, I've let something get to me and yeah. it's affected the way the interaction with my patient and I would go. And I had to learn right away quickly how to manage that after my assistant would kick me under the chair. So how do you do it? Well, that's, that's a brilliant question. And one I struggled with a lot because I'm an emotional person. I get very involved emotionally mm -hmm. with things as they're occurring. And you know, it was my spiritual counselor called her. She was a, a coach that I had for many years in Los Angeles. One of the best uh, teachers I ever had, Sanda Jasper. I called her one day because I was sort of frozen in fear in my apartment. I, I, I went to the bad side. You know what I mean? I, I, let, my, I let myself get overwhelmed. And then I, I really was just kind of frozen in fear. I didn't know what to do. And I did something that was uncharacteristic of me. I picked up the phone and I called her. Wow. 
I would normally tend to just go inward and roll around with everything going on in my head. And she, she, this is what she told me to do. And I've been doing these things ever since. The first thing she said is get up and move to another room mm -hmm. or go outside if you can. Change your immediate environment. If you're in bed, get out of bed. Even if it's really hard, if you're sitting, stand up. If you're inside, go out. I mean, it's a little simple thing. If you're really stuck, especially, right? Then she said, reach out. She said, which is what you did. She said, you called me. Pick up the phone, you know, outreach. Take the risk of calling someone or speaking to someone about what you're feeling. Now, again, that was so uncharacteristic of me, but now I will do that now more than I ever did. And I do that with my, my husband, God love him, who pull, helps to pull me up out of the well. Sometimes I need to just talk it through the well. I go into the well, as he calls it, and I just need to talk it out and be heard. Even just the act of sharing it helps me. Absolutely. And then the third thing, it's, it's again, uh, write it out. Mm -hmm. It's that journaling that we talked about again. Write it out. Make sense of it on paper. Take it out of you and put it somewhere. You know? So really, honestly, those three things um, were game changers for me. And I still use them. Yeah, I remember a moment in time when I was going, struggling with something really, you know, during that time, it was pretty traumatic for me. And I wrote it all out and I put it in an envelope and I set it on fire. Oh, what a great thing. And made it made it everything you know i just wrote all of the things that i was feeling on that and i just gave it a little blessing lit it up on fire watched it go away and it was gone it was an amazing reaction and i don't i don't know if i had heard that from somebody or if i learned i have no idea where that came from to be honest with you but that's that's how i dealt with it so great 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 I think that any anything ritualistic like that is so useful. I love that you did that. Yeah, I need to. Well, that I'm out of my questions, my friend. But <laughs> I think we've done we've done an hour and a half of talking, which is absolutely amazing. So I can't thank you enough for hanging out with me for a while. And I got to tell you, the content and the information that you shared today is invaluable to these young women. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really sincere, sincerely appreciate you sharing and being here, really. Thank you so much for listening to the Women in Dentistry podcast with Dr. MJ Hanlon. If you like our show and want to know more about us, check out our website, thewomenindentistry.com, or please leave us a review on iTunes. Join us for our next episode as we bring you another amazing woman leading the way for the next generation.